Hello, this is Steve Ramona, your host for Doing Business with a Servant's Heart. I want to thank our sponsors, InPhone, and with InPhone, you can place your business on everybody's cell phone, turn their business into a web app, and with a click of a button, they'll have access to you 24-7. And also Pantheon.fm. Have you ever thought about monetizing and taking your podcast to the next level? Well, Pantheon can do that. Let us show you how. Reach out to Steve Ramona, the host, at info.co slash sr1, and I will go over with you how you can make your podcast really stand out. Let's enjoy the show. Thanks again, everybody. Welcome, everyone, to Doing Business with a Servant's Heart podcast. And I want to announce we just hit 200 shows. This is show 201. And my guest is excited to break this 200 mark because he's got leadership in a box that we all can do. He simplifies it. And he's made me a better leader in the two calls I've had with him. Can you imagine what he's going to do on this show? Dave, welcome to the show. Hey, Steve. Thanks. Hey, you know what? 201, I will take it for a variety of reasons. One is somebody told me that most podcasts last 11 episodes. So if you can get to the 12th episode, you have some longevity, uh, which is, which is, which is amazing. So you are, you are, you're, you're established and, and you're out there. The second thing is, is that uh, what uh, lesson number one out of this, uh, pick up the phone, reach out, uh, see value in yourself. Other people will see your value. The connections will happen. The conversations will happen. You'll hear something you've never thought of. You'll probably give somebody some. You'll give somebody a nugget that they can use, and then the networking starts. And as we were talking about before we started, uh, what a magic thing that is! Because when you're feeling down or feeling a little lonely in this journey, whatever it is, whatever it is, just even in basic life, sometimes people pop in and they change everything. They change the whole dynamic. They change the energy and those type of things. And and so. Uh, you're changing energy, brother, and we're going to do that. So let's let's get after it. Thank you, Dave. I, I appreciate that, and you're right. It, it It's a big difference. It's changed my life. I know it's changed yours. I, I want to jump into the book because I love the title. It's sure. catchy, but you'll sure. never forget it. What's the name of the title? What's the title of the book? And, when, and tell me more. Yeah, well, When when the Cows Lie Down. Hmm. And, and the subtitle is Why People Quit You, Their Leaders. Uh, there's a couple things there. When the cows lie down, derived from my rearing as a farm kid in Northern California on a dairy farm. And I've always said, uh, and that's something you can relate to, right, Steve? So I've yeah. always said that I've always said that everything you need to learn in life, leadership, love, uh, you know, just kind of growing, you know, and, and getting to be the person that you want to be. And then and then to a point where you can give back, because you know, that's my mission on a on a variety of levels, is uh you can learn it on the farm. And one of the very subtle lessons on the farm that that always made me chuckle uh, was the cows. Because, you know, on a dairy farm, you got to go get the cows twice a day, bring them into the barn and milk them. And the cows are in all different arrays. On, on those hot Northern California days when it's 116, the cows are probably all standing in the water, right? <laughs> and, and on those cold, misty days or, uh, you know, when the last bale of hay you threw in the field for them to eat is in the far, far corner, they're all down <laughs> in the far corner. But there's those there's those off days where all the cows are lying down. And it's usually around some spindly little tree. And that's when you really need to stop, slow everything down, maybe change your routine a little bit and assess, at, you know, in, in that instance, assess the weather. You might be having a, a storm that's going to be a wind event, a major rain event that might cause flooding, hail events, those kind of things. And, and, the, and the cows know that. I know there's scientists out there that refute that and barometric changes. All I know is when the cows lie down, I stop what I'm doing and I look up in the sky or I'll go get some information and say, why in the heck is that going on? And uh, oddly enough, it's usually true. And so it's the difference between putting valuable equipment away or how you manage a crop and all the things that go along with that based on, on what they're showing. So it's, um, it's, it's analogous to the larger bits and pieces in life, especially in our, in our businesses and our work life and our, in our, in our relationships that we can get going so fast or get in such a routine that we miss when the cows are lying down. So there's a lot of figurative cows in the book. The, the quitting piece is, I'm a firm believer that the people quit their leaders. Now, I'm gonna, I have to qualify this. I've got a great friend that we were, we're leader culture back and forth. 
leaders set culture. And when I say leaders, there's only one leader of an organization. There's lots of bosses. You can build better bosses, but there's one leader of an organization. And that leader lays in the culture. So there's some examples in there of, of poor leadership that caused even personal examples uh, where even I failed. And so you have to be you have to be really careful as the leader how you set the culture because once the culture's offset, uh, then you get into these things of why do I have big turnover and why are my HR costs through the roof and and those type of things. So that's in there, but it really boils down to good quitting, bad quitting, and quitting when you don't have a choice. And you know the first chapter is about a near and dear friend of mine that died very young of cancer and and he had to quit. He didn't have a choice. Um, he was transitioning. Uh, he kind of knew it and. The way he decided to do that and the way he left this planet is probably an example of how we should probably go through all adverse situations in our lives. And it really boils down to attitude. So you have that. And then there's good quitting, right? Sometimes in organizations, we want, oh, I, you know, not just organizations, but sometimes we need to quit for our own health and well-being, or we need people to quit because they are not what we need on the team. The best example I can give being a military guy of 30 years is special operations, special forces. We usually tie that to Navy SEALs and, and you know, mm -hmm. Army or Army Rangers and those type of people. They have a curriculum for entrance that makes people quit. And the reason that they want you to quit is not because that you're inferior human or that you don't have anything to contribute, is they are refining it down to a single type of person. It doesn't mean that that person's better. It just means that they are the best job fit. And so those people that quit have to go because the team has to be as strong as the quote unquote weakest, weakest link. And so there's a calling, there's a calling there and that quitting, that's good quitting. And then the bad quitting is, you know, the scorched earth and throwing stuff at your boss and running out the door and destroying your relationships with people and, and, you know, closing doors that may reopen. I always tell people when you quit a job, just uh, quit the job like you'll need it back in a month. Yeah. And if you, if you do that, that's 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 a good thing. So the book no. covers a uh, the book covers a lot of that. And yeah. you know, at the end of all the chapters, I, the book is not there to say Dave did this and he knows this is an absolute. So here's your five wise, twelve hows, or seven habits of stuff that you need to exhibit. The book is written with with open ended one liners to drive introspection, so that you can apply it to yourself in whatever aspect you like. It fits. It fits. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I love slow down. Because we talked in the green room about you said it and repeat what you said about the Americans nowadays. Oh, yeah, especially America. So pretty well traveled. I've lived all over the world. I mean, lived in countries all over the world on uh, all continents except for Antarctica. I, I take a little bit of privilege with uh, Australia because I haven't been there that long. But the rest of them I've lived, lived on. And, and uh, what amazes me is that when you get around certain cultures, not that they have it all right. But they've had longer to practice, yeah. especially countries, right? So Europe's been around, you know, 10 times longer than the United States of America. And they've had longer to practice. And I think that they've gone through some of the phenomenons that we're going through. But as a society in America, we are going so fast. It's like saying, I went to Niagara Falls. And you go, well, what did you see? And you go, well, I saw the falls and I saw the mist and it was great. And you go, well, did you, did, you know, did you notice the bends in the river and the Canadian border and, the, and the, you know, there's bears up there? And you go, no, no, I didn't see that. And you go, well, how did you see it? And they say, well, you know, from the interstate going 85 miles an hour. You and I can both say we've been to Niagara Falls, but who's really been to Niagara Falls? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, if you think about that in your in your home life and your business, so this is about balance, right? It's about life balance. When you think about that, you have to slow down to go faster. And we have how much money goes out the door because we're in a hurry. <laughs> this goes this goes down to culture. This goes down to process, even assembly lines, you know, literal process and figurative process. We get those those things going so fast because we want to accomplish one thing and get on to the next thing. And we give ourselves a grade based on quantity and not quality. I don't know where that went, except other than the speed limit phenomenon. I spent a lot of time in the military towards the end when I was in executive leadership. Because being a chief and you're, you know, you're kind of the shepherd over all of the enlisted people and you're the buffer between the senior, the senior officers. When something gets screwed up, when you have failure, it was, you know, chief, go take a look at that. 
take your experience and go take a look at that. Steve, I, and these were some catastrophic things. These were bad, bad operations of vehicles that hurt people really bad or had people, you know, get killed. And I would go look at things and it was two things, you know, which kind of drives a little bit of the book, two things, lots of cows lying down in the organization and a leader culture that was put in place that drove the speed limit where nobody could see the danger. What for whatever desired effect. And it's really a penny wise and pound foolish. It really comes down to economics, yeah. right? Yeah. Because you're like, I can't, if I heard it one more time, well, I don't think we can afford that. And I would say, no, there's no way you can't, you can afford not to. And then I would get the, I would get the, well, what do you mean? And I would say, well, you're saving $20,000 a year by deferring this, whatever it is. That's mm -hmm. maintenance or road. You're saving this. When you have the failure that I just described, you've just spent 3.7 million. It's, but nobody wants to draw that corollary. And so sometimes we need to look at that in our lives too. So I'll use this example. It's very cliche. But if you trade off five or six of your kids' soccer games <laughs> because you're too busy at work, you know, and I, I was a military guy. There was a lot of times I had to miss stuff, right? Because you're too busy at work, you don't ever get those back. And what does that conversation sound like when your kid's 25, 26, 27 years old? When he's talking about who you were, were you present, were you at the right things? I've done that gut check with my kids. They've been very grace, graceful with me, or gracious with me. Mm -hmm. And they've said, you know, you were there when I was important. But I'm like, well, but I wasn't there all the time. You know, I know the spaces that I missed. And I think back to, and I can tell you what I was thinking and saying that got me to miss those activities, but I can't even tell you what they were. And I don't even know if I'd have missed them if they would have been important. Mm -hmm. that, that's, so you're talking about this whole time about awareness, the cows oh. lying down, being aware of the oh, cows, being aware you're going fast and DoorDash. DoorDash Absolutely. is built because of speed. Absolutely. I, I don't have time to go to the grocery store, so I'll just pay extra and pay more pricing, higher pricing, because DoorDash does that. Uh, but it's convenience, and they, they're making money, uh, our speed. There's a lot of people in this country that are broke because they can't break themselves of immediate gratification. Yeah. Back in the day, if you told your parents, you the first car I ever owned was a 1957 Chevy Stepside pickup with a 235 and a granny gear in it for, mm. those, for those older people. Beautiful. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a, uh, a mortisized city truck. The city maintenance guys used it. It was, it was painted in about four different colors. It was atrocious, <laughs> but it's what I could afford based on the money that I had made for my summer job. Nobody, I didn't throw a piece of plastic on the table and buy that truck. I had, 10 $100 bills in my hand that were fresh from the bank. And I handed it to a guy and he handed me the keys and we did a little pink slip thing. And I drove my truck away because, because I had to do the work on the front end. And so when you don't do the work on the front end, what that looks like is getting business loans that you know that you can't repay because you don't even have a, you don't even have a financial model to start. Yeah. Yeah. And it's where all debt is now. Medical right. credit card. Student all loans. That, all that. I had a I had a banker that does business loans the other day, and she was talking to me about. I was asking her about interest rates and all that type of stuff, and she said, she said we printed eighty percent of all the money, all the hard currency in this country. Eighty percent of it that's been printed was printed during the two years of COVID. Oh, jeez. She said, "How do you get that back? Think about that strategy. That strategy." That was that strategy was chosen. It was built on immediacy and instant gratification, and it did not tie to a long term. It had no long term uh, strategy tied to it. And now here we are, like you know, in our in our in our country now, like Braille, trying to figure out this new economic model because we changed it completely. Yeah. And then people people wonder why recession, no recession. You know, all of these numbers are not correlating with the numbers of the past. Yeah, because you have 80% of all the money's out there floating around and they don't know how to get it back. Yeah, that's, that's a dangerous mode. 
we can, we won't get into politics, but no, uh, it's uh, no, it's it's just a thing. Yeah, it just is what it is. Leadership is about accountability. You talked about that in our first call. Sure. Talk about that. Well, and that's really oversimplified, right? Yeah. Leadership, <laughs> if you're doing leadership appropriately, you should be lonely. 50% of your people should not be happy with you. And you should have very few what you call friends in your subordinate, in your subordinate tier. Because leadership is more about uh, directing and guiding an organization to accomplish something. And that could be that could be the pastor of a church, right? And and where you want to end up. You 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 find me a church that has a huge congregation that everybody's happy with the pastor. Everybody's got some criticism over the pastor, and they they just can't believe he asked for a second donation this week to do X, yeah. Y, and Z because they don't understand the economics of how to run a church, right? So. Um, so the reason it's about accountability is, is because um, for, well, we've kind of developed a practice now where we can abdicate our leadership responsibilities and you can't, you can delegate the responsibility to accomplish certain things that are required to get the overall mission done. But when that all, that house of cards all comes crashing down, Goodbye. it has to, it, and it has to be you. I had a law, this, this is kind of funny. You hedged on this. <laughs> because um, um, my buddy who just wrote a book, her name's Kimberly Benoit. She wrote a book, we've all done it. And she talks about uh, toxic workplaces. And this displacement of responsibility has become uh, endemic in our country. Yeah. And I, and I, and we're getting good at it. I mean, people <laughs> actually have pre, they, people actually have pre-built narratives on when they go to do something, they have pre-built narratives where they, I've already made an excuse for the thing to fail, which means they didn't do their proper planning or, or they don't, you know, they don't even believe in their own vision. Yeah. Uh, and I speak generally and, and globally, and that's not true. I mean, there's some good leaders out there, but I will tell you, I, you know, I told you, I think that we have a two, we have two generations of neglected people that have been neglected in formal leadership training. And, and I don't know how to get that back other than a lot of hard work and waking up short of having a major catastrophe where, where we revalue that but yeah but development of our people and leadership training formally and informally and mentorship and the type of things that existed in organizations previously have been given away because the speed limit's so fast that we don't have time to send steve to two weeks of training at the university of x y and z to get some senior with that that they we don't see value in that and oh, by the way, if Steve's gone, the world's going to fall apart, which there's so much wrong with that, right? Because if Steve's yeah. a single point of failure, then the company's going to fail. Yeah, there's a big problem there. Right. Well, let's do it. You, you, I got all these points written down on my paper sure. here. Let's do a shout out. Somebody's going to mm -hmm. want to reach out to you, if not a lot of people, to ask more questions, get the book or whatever. How can oh, they right. reach you? How can they reach right. out to you? I make it really simple. If you go to www.maxfabconsulting.com, that M A X F A B, consulting.com everything's there you can listen to the podcast that i do you can listen to the podcast i've been on to include this one we'll, you know we'll get it we'll get it out there and uh, uh my blogs and my newsletters are there if you uh, send me a note i'll sign you up for the newsletter there's a lot of this stuff in there and the things that uh, i blog about and the books are there uh with the with the you know with the the one clicks to to sign up and and if you do it right uh, and, and get it back to me then i will uh I'll uh, sign a copy and return it to you. So, Well, that's awesome. So I'm going to give out some money today. So the first five people that reach out to you, I'm going to send you a $20 Amazon gift card listener. So just mention my name, mention the show to Dave. He'll give me your contact, your email. That's all I need. And I'll send you a $20. Uh, no questions asked because what you're hearing okay. is game changing for your business or for your life, your husband, a wife, mm -hmm. we're leaders everywhere. And we don't realize it. We need to realize it. We need to realize when the cows have lied down that we've got to do something. That's why I love having you on. And it does say doing business with a servant's heart, but it's also doing life with a servant's heart, which is my other podcast I'm going to do. Right. They cross over so many times. Yeah. You have a military background and we won't get into the story because I'm going to bring you back to talk about your story, which is great. Sure. Um, I love vets. If I had a company, I would hire vets. Ugh. What has the military taught you that helps you in business? 
Wow. Well, you know, my passion now is vet ready, right? And that's working with civilian employers that don't understand. And this is not, it's not a knock on people. It's just understanding a knowledge gap. And it's something we haven't filled as a country. So, you know, my passion is, is you know, if you're a business owner and you want, especially in this competitive environment with, with the way employment is right now, if you want veterans in your organizations and you really want to mine it, you really need to bring somebody in like me that can uh, school you up. You spend a lot of money trying to figure out how to lead millennials and Zs and do all those other things. Uh, veterans are a subset of that. In fact, we, you know, we, we, we need an inclusive environment when we come out because the transition's hard. And I won't get into the, to the, to the bigger pieces of that. Cause to your question is here's some things that people don't know. My, my leadership journey started on November 30th of 1984, the day that I stepped foot off of the bus into the face of a training instructor screaming at me at 11 o'clock at night in San Antonio, Texas. I didn't know that. But four days later, he leaned over while we were going into the chow hall. He leaned over and he said, I'm going to make you a squad leader. I had no idea what that meant. But I knew it had something to do with the squad and it had something to do with the leader because those were the two words I was given. <laughs> and one was an adjective and one was a noun. So those two things I knew, even though I, I stunk at English. When they put, And they put a little plastic pin on my uniform that said squad leader. Now, I'm in basic training with 50 guys that all they're trying to do is survive the next six to eight weeks so that we can go to tech school and then get out into the real Air Force because this is miserable, right? You don't want to sleep with 50 guys. You don't want to shower with 50 guys. You don't want to run, jump, and do all the things that they want you to do because you're scared to death. And most of us are driven off of fear of failure. And all they want you to do is be successful. Well, then I lost all my friends. Steve, <laughs> I lost all my friends. Now I was a student leader. Now I'm this I'm this squishy part somewhere between this big main training instructor and their experience. And I'm having an experience with four other squad leaders and a dorm chief. So five student leaders. Just hold that thought. So my leadership journey started then. And and some of it was through trial, trial and tribulation, but I never felt alone because somebody was there to, to, to carry me along. And then came formal training. It came it, things like this. Pack your stuff up. You're flying to this part of the world, to this place where there's a schoolhouse. And you're going to go into the schoolhouse and be formally trained on leadership. Forget about everything you're doing at work. Somebody else will take care of your job. Can you imagine that? People don't know that about veterans when they walk through the door. What they know is what they see on television. Yep. Navy, Navy SEAL movies, kicking in doors, catching the bad guys. And my banker friend that I had mentioned earlier was sitting with a multi-million dollar one of our, he's a billionaire, but he's 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 made multi millions in a certain industry, and we were, they were talking about this phenomenon, and he was asked specifically, "Do you see veterans as high function?" And he said, "Absolutely not, mm. absolutely not." But do you blame him? No, because what he has to consume about veterans should make him assume that we are uh, we're great. We're great with a shovel in our hands and we're great when the, the chips are down. Yeah. But we we are not we are not ready to walk into your C-suites. We're not ready to be walk into your directorships. We're not ready to be in your strategic planning. We're not ready to help you set mission, uh, mission and vision and 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 uh, formulate a, uh, you know, a, 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 a momentum and inertia and to guide all of that. And most definitely, we're not qualified to lead civilian people because of that military thing. And that is so upside down wrong. The sad part about it is when that culture exists, that mindset exists, when the veteran gets in there, it becomes not only toxic, it becomes lethal. And that's a big word. I'm going to draw the line for you. When you leave the military, there's no bridge. We take yeah. better care. We take better care of our incarcerated people when they get out than we do veterans. Thank you. And I had this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. When you get out of the when you get out of prison and you're in the prison and you've got your own language and your own culture and your own routines, not indifferent to the military. It's actually very synonymous. When you get out, you get a parole officer, an ankle bracelet, uh, pre-release. They'll find you a job. They'll check with your employer. They do all they'll, they'll p test you and 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 have you blow in a breathalyzer so that you stay off of substance, right? When you get out of the military, which there's 1,300 of us today, there's 1,300 brand new veterans today and every day. 
with their families. So that's mm. that's that's a small town of about where I grew up in Northern California, about 4,400 people. 4,400 people. And they go into the, these organizations. And what are they looking for? They're looking for values alignment. They're looking for camaraderie. They're looking for teamwork. They're looking for their for their um, for their their battle buddies and their wingmen and and um, and that sense of purpose. I mean, got to hold that that sense of purpose. Yeah. So when you wake up every day and there's reveille and there's a flag and you salute the flag and they're all dressed the same and somebody says we're training on this and here's the mission. It's hard not to have a sense of purpose. Tell me, civilian organizations on at large. Uh, you know, on mass, tell me civilian organizations that have a culture that people actually understand the purpose at a level that at a level. So we get into organizations, we struggle with language, we struggle with understanding. We 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 can see in the first five minutes exactly where the things are broken and we know how to fix them almost immediately. This causes tension. Nobody wants to have the conversation. The veteran loses purpose, and forty-three yeah. out of every, and forty-three out of every hundred veterans leave their job in the first year. So, wow. and, well, and you don't know how to mine it because there's nothing in the environment. We're products of two things, Stephen. Two things only: genetics and our environment. That movie Trading Places has got some brilliance in it. If you yeah. remember the old, it's got. And so, mm -hmm. genetics we can't do much about other than other than make smart choices, right? Mm -hmm. but our environment we can shift and when you're in charge of the environment back to leaders leaders being toxic leaders setting culture when you're in charge of the environment shift it and you're not talking about you're not talking about changing the culture in a in a, in a, in a where you're going to run everybody else off because you're trying to create a, um, a veteran environment but i'll give you one example i tell leaders of companies find out who your veterans are almost none of them I have yet to find one of them that can tell me exactly how many veterans they employ. Part of that's their fault. Part of it's the fault of HR systems and protection of privacy and the veterans. A lot of veterans don't tell people. Right, right. Right. So there's so there's a, there's a dynamic there. But I tell them they need to find that out. And once they find that out, have a veteran afternoon, 90 minutes. All the veterans meet, give them a big haul, walk into the room and write on the board the biggest problem that you have in the, in the company biggest challenge that you have in your company. It could be a financial problem. It could be a manufacturing problem. It could be a logistics problem, whatever. Mm -hmm. Write it on a board and say, here's a desired outcome. And say, can you come up with some solutions? I don't care. In five minutes, they will have appointed a leader. <laughs> in an hour, they'll have four viable solutions that you can use. Two of them you may have to refute because they didn't understand maybe some legal, you no know, legal, moral, ethical things. Outside stuff, but, yeah. Right, right. But you'll have four solutions you can use, and they'll spend the last half an hour coming up with the most ridiculous thing in the world just so because they have a sense of humor, and it will be something that will make you laugh. And they'll have all of that for you. Powerful. Yeah. They're extremely powerful. It's it it is it is like looking at the side of a mountain, and you go, "Gosh, that is just the ugliest mountain," and there's no trees growing on it, and inside it is the rare, rare minerals of the earth that we need. And I teach you how to mine it. <laughs> so That's fantastic. Well, we're running out of time here. Yeah, I'm sorry, brother. No, <laughs> no, never be sorry because <laughs> content that that's good needs to be spoken. And yeah. it crosses personal and professional. I said that earlier, yeah. but everything you said is, is apropos for people. Right. And we can change it slowly, little by little, but it's right. going to take time. And we have to have patience. Amen. So work just, with the vets, have patience. You yeah. know where they came from. Treat them like everybody else. That's just the label. That was their job. You know, yeah. my job's a podcast host. He went out to Afghanistan or yeah. I, wherever he went or she, that yeah. was just their job. Let's not make it any different. Yeah. Treat them the same like yeah. you would treat anybody else. Yeah. And I think we'd be on our way to a, a good uh, – good path of, of helping veterans. It's yeah. my goal as well. So yeah. thank you for being on. We're yeah. going to bring you back because my notebook sure. got full and I got to write more notes. Sorry, so man. just for that, no, just for that, I got to fill my notebook up. Yeah. And listeners, don't forget, reach out, mention the podcast and I'll pay you guys, yeah. you know, a little reward, uh, but get his book. What's the book's name again? When the cows lie down, why people quit you, their leader. Love it. Love hearing that. It makes me smile every time I hear it. Yeah. With that being said, can you give the audience a tip that you've learned that they could take away today and help sure. them in their journey? 
Sure. Three, three really quick things. Three things that you have to have. Everything in life, you need to get up to waist level. If you spend your life bent over at the uh, bent over at the waist, you're going to have back problems, figurative and literal. And so, take the time to get things up to waist level to work on them. You'll be more successful. Two is you need a really, really solid foundation. So spend money on your foundation. If you spend all day on your feet, spend money on your shoes. But whatever your foundation is, make sure that it's rock solid, and that's where you need to invest. And number three is. We need our minds to make ourselves as effective and 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 uh, and successful as possible. And what you put in your mouth affects your mind. So moderate, choose what you consume, a figurative and literally, and uh, make that make the the healthy choices both figuratively and literally. And you know if you can do those three things, you're off to a good start.